could slowly start and if anyone else is late more than this let them join in later so good evening everyone our guest for tonight is professor ishita banerjee dube who is a professor researcher at the college of mexico at their center for asian and african studies and also one of their highest ranking uh, researchers in their national system uh, uh, she is a visiting professor at many universities in her home India, in the USA, in some other American countries. She focuses mostly on modern Indian history, gender studies, the issues of religion. She has authored six books herself and multiple edited books, I think. She has some very interesting books such as A History of Modern India, which was published by the Cambridge University Press, but also some very interesting books on religious subjects, such as Religion, Law and Power, and Divine Affairs, that might be interesting for our students. I have an apology from our honorary president of the forum, Professor Seema Avramovich, our former dean, he was supposed to be present, and he usually uh, opens every forum lecture, but unfortunately, because of some personal problems, he is unable to attend tonight. So he sends his regards, and he'll certainly look at the recording of the lecture when we publish it. So I am very happy to have Professor Banerjee Dube with us tonight. Uh, in a way, for all its ills, the pandemic has enabled this, or at least made it easier, because had we invited you to come to Belgrade to hold a lecture, that would have been very complicated and expensive. And this way, we can just connect and see you out there in that beautiful Mexican sunshine. It's already evening here in Belgrade. and. We have very crazy weather. We had snow two days ago, and today it's again spring weather. So let's at least enjoy some of your weather that we see there through the camera. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, and you'll just tell me when to start the PowerPoint you gave me. Yes. OK, thank you very much. And I'm going to say that I have to stop my video because I will, I'll read from the screen. I'll read my text from the screen. So please bear with me. Uh, you will get to hear my voice and you will see the images that Nina will very helpfully project. But while I speak, I'll have to stop the video and, uh, and put, the, put the text on my screen. Okay, so. I don't think you have to stop the video for that, but if you're more comfortable like that, no problem. Ah, okay, okay, fine. But I okay. think we I'll can leave see the video you. on. You can see my face while I speak. You're right, you're right. Let me get to my text. Okay. okay. So and I'm starting the PowerPoint and someone will just confirm me that to me that it's visible. Can just someone say We can see it, yeah, we can see okay. it, it's there. Okay, wonderful. Go ahead. You'll just tell me when to change the slides. Yes, you will. You will hear the names and you will know. But anyway, okay. So okay. yeah. So oh. at the outset, yeah. Thank you very much. Should I begin? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. At the outset, I would like to express my deep appreciation and offer my sincere thanks to Nina Crucial Janin. I'm not sure if I've got it right, and the Forum Romanum for giving me this rare opportunity to speak at a forum of scholars interested in Roman and ancient law and share some thoughts, approach and understandings related to historical processes in India. Keeping in mind, so thank you very, very much, as you said that, you know, certain good things that have happened through uh, COVID uh, is, is that we can connect across space time. So, Keeping in mind an incisive comment of Shahid Amin, an eminent historian of India, about how theories travel while actual histories do not, I wish to take the opportunity of this gracious invitation to offer some fragments of the history of India related to law and legal practices 
in an attempt to make histories and historical experience travel and open dialogues across space, time, and disciplines. Nina, you could put the first slide maybe now. Our, thank you. Our story begins in the late 18th century, in late 18th century India, with the first governor general of the English East India Company, Warren Hastings. To give the context very briefly, the English East India Company was established as a joint stock company of traders and mer merchants based in London towards the end of 1600 to participate in the vibrant Indian Ocean trade. As a rival to the Dutch company, it was granted monopoly over all trade between England and Asia by a royal charter of 31 December 1600. Formal trading began in 1613 when a farman, a license of the Mughal emperor Jahangir, allowed the company to set up factories in India. Interested in textile and spices, the company set up factories near the ports of Madras, Chennai, Bombay, now Mumbai, and Hooghly, and later Calcutta in Bengal, and gradually moved into the hinterland from the ports, trying to control the producers as well as inland trade that involved it in clashes with local rulers. In a situation where the company did not have political so sovereignty, it began administering justice in its own factories and gradually in the presidency towns of Madras, Bombay and Calcutta. The company's military triumph over the Nawab of Bengal in 1757 and subsequently against a combine of the Nawabs of Bengal and Awadh and the Mughal Emperor in 1764 gave it great powers over the flourishing Bengal presidency. It also got the right to collect the revenue of the province from the Mughal Emperor in 1765. The company's entry as the revenue collector and open plunder by its servants caused havoc. Bengal suffered a devastating famine in 1770-71. Warren Hastings was appointed the following year by the directors of the company. Hastings and the four members of his committee of circuit were enjoined to adopt proper measures for the collection of revenue and for the administration of civil and, and also criminal justice for the Europeans and, and uh, English uh, resident in, the, in Calcutta. So the company, uh, Warren Hastings and the four members of his committee were enjoined to adopt proper measures for the collection of revenue and for the administration of justice. A regulating act of the British Parliament in 1773 made Hastings the governor general subordinating thereby the presidencies of Madras and Bombay to Bengal and its new capital in Calcutta. In 1772, Hastings and his, and his circuit committee proposed a judicial plan that was implemented by the Bengal government. This plan is of great significance since it laid out the basics for the administration of justice for the English and Europeans in general, resident in Calcutta and Bengal, and quote unquote, the natives. The judicial plan claimed to be, and I quote from Hastings's judicial plan, the judicial plan claimed to be adapted to the manners and understandings of the people and exigencies of the country and adhered as closely as possible to their ancient usages and institutions." Unquote. Why was such an affirmation necessary? Warren Hastings, a veteran servant of the company, had served in Bengal between 1750 and 64, had direct experience of the administration of the Nawabs of Bengal, the Muslim rulers of Bengal, and faith in the Mughal system of administration. He did not think of the Bengal Nawabs as degenerate and despotic, a belief widely shared by British officials and the company's servants, and believed in the existence of a Mughal constitution. Hence his assertion that the judicial plan adhered closely to ancient usages and institutions. At the same time, 
Hastings's Orientalist cosmopolitanism of the 18th century was undercut by a lingering sense of Asian barbarism and Oriental despotism. His judicial plan reflected this push and pull. It had a dual purpose, to protect the British and European subjects resident in Bengal by administering them under English statutory law and to allow the natives who, and I quote again, indulged in their own prejudices, civil and religious, to enjoy their customs unmolested, unquote. The plan, by providing for the establishment of civil and criminal courts in the districts, in addition to the mayor's court in Calcutta, that became the Supreme Court in 1773, brought the residents of Bengal under the company's jurisdiction. By demarcating the private or personal matters where the natives could enjoy their customs unmolested, the judicial plan sought to ensure smooth and uninterrupted collection of revenue, the primary object of the reforms. The judicial plan also clarified, and this is also important, and I quote, that in all suits regarding inheritance, marriage, caste, and other religious usages or institutions, the laws of the Quran with respect to the Mahometan, that's the, what the language they used, and those of the Shastr, meaning Shastra scripture, with respect to Gentus, shall be in, invariably adhered to. It is interesting that they, they are calling the others who are not Mahomatans Gentus, comes from gentlemen, not yet Hindus, but they are thinking of what would later be uh, identified, who the, the people would be la later be identified as Hindus, but at this stage they are still Gentus. So, so the plan clarified that in all suits regarding inheritance, marriage, caste, and other religious usages or institutions, the laws of the Quran with respect to the Mahometan and those of the Shastar with respect to Gentus shall invariably be adhered to. Unquote. This was the genesis of what is known as personal law for communities or collectivities or collectives identified on the basis of religion in India. Personal law, it bears mention, is also present in other countries that have undergone British colonization. The judicial plan was poised on a belief in the fundamental divide between the East and the West and the existence of different codes for different groups. Of even greater significance is the view that these groups, communities, were religious and followed the directives of their faith or religion without demur. This explains the division of the inhabitants of Bengal and later India into Mahometans and Gentus. It should be noted, however, that marriage, inheritance, caste, and other religious usages or institutions marked out as the private sphere of the natives actually corresponded to matters that fell within the jurisdiction of ecclesiastical and bishops' courts in Britain. Hence, even while the purpose behind ceding jurisdiction in family and religious affairs to private authorities was to gain, and I quote, native consent for foreign rule, the arbitrary assumption that the inhabitants of be inhabitants belonging to multiple cultural and religious traditions were reducible to Gentus and Mahometans, lumped together myriad and fuzzy sectarian orders into these two categories, later identified as Hindus and Muslims made religion the principal basis of communitarian identity and objectified and transformed Indian society in decisive and enduring ways. The personal laws of the four communities that continue to be in force in India today are widely defined as religious personal laws in academic legal journals. Initially, law courts and English judges took the help of pundits, literally learned men from the highest caste of Brahman, 
whose traditional calling is teaching and priesthood, and Qazis, Muslim lawgivers, to offer verdicts on personal matters of Hindus and Muslims, resulting in what has been called a Brahmanization and Islamization of local customs and usage. In addition, Hastings's belief that Shastra, scriptures, written texts, and not custom form the basis of the law of the natives propelled a search for quote unquote original legal texts. Hastings convened a group of pundits to identify legal decisions on various matters in, in the huge corpus of Sanskrit texts known as the Dharma Shastras, scriptures relating to faith, Dharma. Selected excerpts from these texts were translated into Persian and from Persian into English. Persian because Persian was still the language of administration in India and it would remain so till the 1830s. Okay, so selected excerpts from and many of the British Orientalist scholars actually had Persian, including William Jones, to whom we'll come very soon. But anyway, Hastings convened a group of pundits to identify legal decisions on various matters in the huge corpus of Sanskrit texts known as the Dharma Shastras. Selected excerpts from these texts were translated into Persian and from Persian into English. This arduous process resulted in the publication of a code of Gentoo laws in 1773. Nina, if you could put the next one, please. Next slide. Thank you. William Jones, a judge, a noted Orientalist scholar and the founder of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784, began to learn Sanskrit to complement his knowledge of Persian in order not to be, and I quote Jones, at the mercy of Brahman Pandits, unquote, by having direct access to the Sanskrit texts. His text, a digest of Hindu law on contract and succession, translated and published posthumously in 1796, would join the Code of Gentoo Laws as an authoritative text on Hindu law, quote unquote, Hindu law. I say quote unquote because the notion of Hindu law is still being challenged and debated by legal scholars. Okay, so, so Jones's digest, therefore, would join the Code as an authoritative text on Hindu law. Together, the Code and the digest created Hindu law by means of an arbitrary selection of prescriptive, moralistic, and normative pronouncements on legal disputes in the Dharma Shastras. And these, these were called Bibado Ornabo Setu in Sanskrit, that is, a bridge on the ocean of disputes. Vivado Ornabo Setu, a bridge on the ocean of disputes. It is not only that terms such as the code, law and digest taken from English legal terminology change the meaning and significance of the Sanskrit texts, Hindu and Muslim, personal law came to be understood, interpreted and implemented by English judges through the lens of English family and ecclesiastical law. Interestingly, this codified personal law that related to quote unquote personal matters was in theory and practice meant for a collective, that is, the community, and not just that, a religious community. We will soon look into the tensions that derive from the beginning, from this conflation of the personal as the collective. At this point, it is important to indicate another very important repercussion of this codification, that is, the idea that Hindu law as religious law was something completely different from Western law where religion and law are taken to be totally separate. This has showed up ideas of the Orient 
as something very different and distant. In fact, in the 1850s, a British judge who was uh, invited to address actually the Society of Arts and Literature, it's interesting, um, and a former justice of the Supreme Court of India, he was invited. He starts by saying the, the personal law is what the oriental mind holds dear and understand. So this is just an example. I was quite surprised to read up this uh, judge's uh, lecture as I was preparing for this talk. Anyway, so this has showed up ideas of the Orient as something very different and distant. It is time now to turn to the impact of communitarian personal laws on women. And Nina, if you could pass on to the next uh, slide, please. And here I will take up a widely known and examined case, and I'm sure some of you know about it too, that of Sati in colonial India. Sati, as you are probably aware, relates both to the practice and to the custom of upper caste Hindu women, upper caste. And I clarify this because in any case, it applied only to a very small percentage of the population. So Sati, relates both to the practice and to the custom of upper caste Hindu women burning themselves in the funeral pyres of their husbands in order to evade entering the inauspicious state of widowhood. It is ironical that its sati is universally translated as widow immolation including by scholars who have worked on sati and feminist scholars too. So it is ironical that sati is universally translated as widow immolation because it defies the very logic of committing sati by the women who did so because they wanted to avoid being a widow. If we follow Hindu tradition closely, the wife of a deceased husband does not formally become a widow till the time the husband's body has been cremated. And this is precisely why women burnt themselves along with the funeral pyres, uh, along with the body of the husband in the fun same funeral pyre, in order not to be enter this inauspicious state of widowhood. So, so this understanding of sati as widow immolation defies the very logic of the women who became sati irrespective of, and this is very important, whether they performed this act voluntarily or were compelled to do so, compelled or coerced to do so. Sati came into prominence in the early decades of the 19th century when a variety of factors intersected to bring about a change in the nature of the rule by the company. In the wake of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, nationalism gained a much greater hold in Britain and pride in being English or British acquired new salience. The company's presence in and hold over India as now quite uh, explicitly, explicitly a colonial power and not just as traders came under scrutiny. Free traders and evangelicals lobbied in the British Parliament to gain entry into India when the company's charter came up for renewal in 1813. And the administrators of the company, influenced by liberalism and utilitarianism, sought to change the nature of the company's rule in India, insisting all along on the necessity of British presence in India. Unsurprisingly, the quote-unquote barbaric customs, particularly of the Hindus, and the terrible condition of women bolstered this civilizing mission and justified colonial rule. Sati, as I mentioned earlier, a heroic act and hence exception, exceptional and always limited to a very small percentage of the population. So Sati, a heroic act and hence exceptional, gained great public prominence particularly during the governor generalship of Warren Hastings. Um, Nina, if you could project the slide on Warren Hastings, because I've forgotten the order. So I don't know if Sati comes first or uh, William Hastings comes first. Thank you. So 
Sati, a heroic act and hence exceptional, gained great public prominence, particularly during the governor generalship of Warren Hastings, when sensational official depiction of it, together with the furious attack of evangelicals, generated hectic public debate amongst British officials and different strands of the Indian literati where quote unquote reformers and quote unquote conservatives engaged in sustained public arguments with one another over sati. And this had greater implications because this is not just about the practice of sati. This is also about a reflection on conjugal relations, on relationships, inter, you know, pers, inter uh, relationships within the family in particular ways that the Indian literati had never been forced to do before because no one had raised these questions or criticized them the way that they were now being questioned and criticized. So. Uh, uh, so there were, you know, hectic, there was hectic uh, public debate um, among the British officials, administrators, judges, and different strands of Indian literati um, over, uh, over Sati. The women, as has been pointed out by the pioneering work of Lata Mani, uh, the book and her first article were called Traditions uh, in Discordance, the debate over Sati in colonial India. It's a pioneering work. The women, as Latamani point, points out, remained mere bystanders, while their bodies provided the site over which white and brown, brown men of different tenors carried out a fervent discussion on whether or not Sati was sanctioned by the scriptures. This resulted in the construction and reconfiguration on what constituted quote unquote tradition by men, Englishmen and Indians who, okay, who were consciously modern, the Englishmen who were consciously modern and the Indian men, some of whom were anxious to be modern. So in, if we follow Latamani's argument, Sati had very little to do with the condition of women or the women, it was actually a modernist debate over what constituted tradition and Hindu tradition in this case. We can take up the implications of Latamani's argument during the discussion. It is important to consider the significance of the debate and the eventual ban on the practice of Sati by a regulation in 1829 for the understanding and applications of application of scriptures and personal laws that governed relations between the colonizers and the colonized at this stage. So, and it has also been pointed out that Sati was practiced before the debate started and it did not end with the, with the formal abolition. But the interesting thing is the changing relations between the colonizers and colonized and also the changing nature of the colonizers and the colonized over matters of family and personal law. And this moment is crucial because this is the beginning of the 19th century and we'll see a change by the, towards the end of the century. So the fact that British administrators and judges ordered Brahman Pandits, now we come to actually how the debate was conducted. So the fact that the British administrators and judges ordered Brahman Pandits to provide answers on whether Sati was sanctioned by scriptures and then they could codified the answers, a wide variety of answers, where the all the pundits are insisting that to the best of their knowledge, you know, if all the other uh, requirements were met, and we can go into the requirements, one of them was that the, the woman had to be an adult and she would have had to have a, a grown-up son who could take care of the family. So that was just one of the requirements. So the pundits are insisting that to the best of their knowledge, if all the requirements were met, Sati was not forbidden, totally forbidden by the scriptures. But the judges and administrators change it too. When they, when they write up their own interpretations, they say Sati is actually sanctioned by the scriptures. 
but we can leave this at a, aside for the discussion because i want to focus on an indirect effect on this what indirect effect of this debate on actually women and uh, for me for this talk also this is more important the fact that the british administrators and judges ordered brahman pandits to provide answers on whether sati was sanctioned by scriptures showed the important impact of Hastings's idea that Hindu law derived from texts and not customs on liberal administrators of the early 19th century. This is another important point. So it has been said that, you know, the diff, the, the rupture, the so-called rupture be, between uh, 18th century Orientalism and 19th century liberalism is not that much of, an, of a rupture, really, because these liberal scholars derive view upon heavily, drew heavily upon the work of the Orientalist scholars. But again, that aside, let's come to the women. Uh, no, before the women, another important point, sorry. More importantly, if one were to follow Hastings' judicial plan, Sati pertained to the sphere of the personal laws over which the natives were meant to have complete jurisdiction. In other words, the company state in intervening at banning Sati was completely contravening the norms it had set for itself. And the fact that reformist, quote unquote, reformist Indian men wanted the intervention of the company state for the prohibition of sati displays an absence of awareness on their part that the colonial state was treading into a terrain that was theirs. And I return to my earlier point, as I said, that it is important to be uh, aware of the changing relations between the colonizer and the colonized and the different constructions of the colonizer and the colonized um, or in, when we discuss this debate. So at this stage, Indian men who want the intervention of the colonial state to ban sati obviously are not questioning the colonial state for treading into an affair, a domain that was personal, that belonged to their personal uh, sphere. Okay, so uh, uh, another important significant fact is that the supporters of the abolition also turned to shastras or scriptures to find out whether uh, they, the, the scriptures endorsed or proscribed, prohibited sati. It was actually the opponents, the so-called conservatives, who argued that custom and practice were as important a part, were as important for the Hindus as scriptures. So he said, they claimed, why should we only look towards scriptures to see whether sati is permitted or sati is forbidden? Customs and practice form as, are very, very important for the Hindus or Gentus. But since they lost out, their important argument fell on deaf ears. This increasing dependence on scriptures would result in a gradual elaboration of what came to be identified as Hinduism in the latter part of the 19th century as a result of combined effort, efforts of Indian reformist men and policies of British administration, a story left for another time. Now, yes, finally, we come to women and personal laws. The abolition of Sati and later the passing of the Widow Remarriage Act in 1856 symbolized colonized men's dependence on scriptures and, the colonials, and on the colonial state to reform their personal laws that were collective and communitarian in a religious sense, but excluded the person, quote unquote, the person of the woman in the construction of the collective a point we will take up when we discuss independent India. It is important, however, to highlight an indirect consequence of the debate on Sati. Inquiries into whether Sati was committed voluntarily by women or whether they were forced to do so, which some scholars have called good Sati, bad, bad Sati, as if, if you are committing it willingly, you are a good Sati, and if you are forced to do it, you are a bad Sati. But the point here is different. It is that inquiries were on whether Sati was com committed voluntarily or, uh, or forcibly meant that unconsciously both British administrators, judges and Indian men, but primarily British administrators, judges, acknowledged the woman as a person with her will or consent. This is a totally unconscious uh, this is a totally uh, 
un, unforeseen consequence because none of the men thought of it this way. But this, there is an acknowledgement of the woman as a person with her own will or consent. This will service, service, surface with great vigor in the age of consent debates of the early 1890s. Look at the ter terminology of the debate, age of consent debate. Uh, I, I'll come to it in a minute. Hence, even though women were excluded from a modernist masculinist debate over tradition, the woman as a person and her consent found entry into legal reformist discourse over the course of the 19th century. Women from different parts of India and of different communities actively participated in the age of consent debate towards the age uh, towards the end of the century and this debate was uh, to raise the age of consent for the consumption of marriage from 10 to 12 and again we are speaking primarily of the brahmans uh, um, who, who who married off who tended to marry marry, marry off their daughters at a very young age before they reached puberty to maintain the purity of the the line of the of the husband's family because in india descent is patrilineal so the women get married into the husband's family and that's the line they continue by giving birth to sons to maintain the purity of that line and also of the father this is precisely to control kind of let's say sexuality so the the women young uh, girls were married off at a very young age but they did not go to cohabit with their husbands till the time they reached puberty. And since some young girls reached puberty at 10, the age limit had been set at 10. Now, what happens in the uh, 1890 is actually a very young girl goes to uh, live cohabit with her husband who is much older. This is again from Bengal. And he forcibly consumed, you know, the marriage is consummated forcibly and she actually dies of that sexual intercourse. And hence, you know, this debate as to whether the age of consent, where again the consent of the child bride is not in, taken into consideration, but as I said, the age of consent should be raised from 10 to 12. Okay. So the publicly expressed opinion of women was, uh, was once again ignored. What is important to note, however, is the fact that Indian men who questioned the right of the colonial state, now ruled directly by the Queen of England and the British Parliament following the revolt of 1857. In 1858, India becomes a direct colony. So what is important to note, however, is the fact that Indian men who questioned the right of the colonial state to intervene in the personal matters of Indians gained success. This was both on account of British uncertainty to tread into internal affairs, particularly, as I said, following the revolt of 1857, uh, and, uh, and the relative maturity of the elite nationalist discourse to mark out its internal frontier and stake its sovereignty over it. For limits of time, we'll have to jump several decades and come to independent India, 1947 and after. The conjoint and convoluted development of colonial and nationalist politics that resulted in the independence of India with partition and the creation of the nation states of India and Pakistan had important repercussions in India's decisions with regard to laws and their application. By the time of independence, it is clear, personal laws had not only had a long life of over 150 years, they also become a crucial element of identity, in particular for the minority communities, once again defined primarily by religion. Not all, but mostly. Okay. They, so the personal laws could not be dispensed with. At the same time, the tortured and violent process that marked the creation of Pakistan as a Muslim state implicitly meant for many that India was Hindu. It was never stated openly, of course, but it was implicit for many. Debates in the Constituent Assembly that drafted the Indian Constitution and in the public, uh, and in the public arena revealed this joint and conflicting pressure and uh, pressure of creating and implementing uniform codes of civil and criminal procedure to be applicable to all Indian citizens and of retaining personal laws. Consequently, the matter of uniform code was put in the 
part or directive principles of state policy and not that of fundamental right. Right to practice one's religion without or any obstacle is, on the other hand, a fine fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. And hence, family or personal laws of communities identified since their inception with religion are difficult to be dispensed with. Four communities have retained their personal laws, just four. The Hindus, the majority community, which is interesting because, as I said, it's meant to be for the minority communities um, and a form of their identity. So four communities have retained their personal laws, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Parsis. Citizens, Indian citizens, of course, have the right to decide on whether they want to revert to the uniform code or take recourse to their own personal laws only relating to the matters that fall within the pur purview of personal laws. To give an example, I can decide to get married uh, under the Hindu code uh, or under the uniform code. Personal laws, and this is another important point, it bears mention are also clubbed together with cultural rights since the Indian constitution grants minorities the right to conserve and promote their culture and make necessary, necessary institutional arrangements to do so. The necessity of preserving the culture of persons belonging to minorities, it bears mention, is also acknowledged by the international community and by provisions of international law. At the same time, culture, community, collective, no cultural, community or collective right, rights raise some very important issues. And some of this was indicated by the anthropologist Veena Das in the 1980s in the wake of a major controversy over Muslim personal laws, which we will take up in if I haven't tried your patience and if you're still interested. So anyway, so this was indicated, some of these is important issues was indicated by Veena Das in the 1980s. To return to these issues, okay. Question one, and you are legal interested in law. On whom is the personal or the family or the cultural right conferred? In other words, who is the legal personality that bears such rights? Is it the in individual who belongs to a minority community or is it the minority community or the collective? How are these communities defined and identified? What makes them minority? Because we all know that, you know, it's not just a demographic um, separation. Okay. If the individual or the person belonging to the collective or community is the bearer of such rights, do cultural rights constitute the sum total of rights of all the individuals who constitute the community or the collective, or are they something distinct? As you can see, these fraught issues defy any easy answer or resolution, and there are none. In the end, if time permits, as I said, I would like to indicate how these tensions have got played out in actual practices of, uh, of resorting to and interpreting personal laws by both by citizens and by chief justices of the Supreme Courts and others, and their impact on state community relations on the one hand and relations between the individual and the community on the other. Needless to say, women as individuals have been directly and often adversely affected by claims made on behalf of the community. And women's groups have sought to resolve such tensions and problems in a variety of ways. And they range from a call to make laws in general and personal laws in particular more gender sensitive, draw up uniform codes for all communities based on a careful selection from personal laws of the different communities. And not just, you know, a uniform code, which is based primarily on the Hindu code. Okay, so, uh, uh, Nina, if you could put the next two slides, because first is about the Hindu code bill, and then the the problems over, you know, the interpretation of personal laws, the sh famous Shabano case of the 1980s, and recently the tri uh, triple talak bill, so that you just see it. We may not have time to go into them. Anyway, so and women's groups have sought to resolve such tensions and problems in a variety of ways that range from a call to make laws in general and personal laws in particular more gender sensitive, draw up uniform codes for all communities based upon a careful selection from personal laws of the different communities to demand a proper codification 
And the other end of the spectrum is to demand a proper codification of Muslim personal laws derived from a return to and reinterpretation of Quranic prescriptions, constitutional and transnational laws that will grant more substantive rights to women. Such struggles and efforts continue while citizens, judges and communities perceive, interpret and deploy personal laws in diverse and often contradictory ways that further fuel politics in particular ways. Now, let me, as I said, let me give three quick examples. Hindu Code Bill 1952-56, Shah Banu 1985 and Shah Rabanu or the Triple Talaq of 1916. I will stop reading from my text now and I'll ask you whether you want details of it or if you're tired or confused. If you could pass the next two, please, uh, Nina. Uh, well, I scrolled through all of them okay, at one great, point, great. but now, feel I free. Think I think the examples yeah. would be interesting. Yeah. So, do you still have the patience to have the to have, have me offer examples, or do we have enough to start a debate and discussion? I think the examples would be nice, but... Examples would be nice? Okay, so I'll be very, very brief, which is why I stopped reading from my text. Hindu Code Bill, let's say, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, whose photo you see, he was the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution, and he was a Dalit leader, an untouchable leader. Okay, so he had a, you know, major role to play in the introduction of what we call compensatory discrimination or positive discrimination or reservation for backward communities groups and communities who are socially back backward on account partly of the caste system primarily of the caste system but also for other counties so it was he who also initiated a discussion on you know whether personal laws should be retained and he thought and this is the interesting bit as the majority community which is not stated they had the what they had the confidence to touch and re reinterpret hindu laws right and uh, ambedkar's point was that you know they need to be uh, redefined to give you know greater rights um, not just to the males of upper caste to males of other castes but also to women you know property marriage succession adoption all these things so what happens is that you know they they are discussed and we have uh, great debates and the uh, you can see the four that that comes to be then codified and in the you know the hindu code bills are passed now the unfortunate uh, implication of this is that the hindu right and other cultural nationalists are claiming that since the hindu code was you know reframed and reformed we should do the same with the code of the other of the minority community and you, here you can see that for the minority communities, it's not as if they do not want it, but they want it to do their own way. And as I said, personal laws, you know, uh, uh, per, per, per prevail in many other societies. And I can give you the example of Egypt, also in Pakistan, where, you know, again, the community is the majority and they've gone through serious changes without any problem. But in India, the fact that you know the hindu code bill has been you know the hindu code hindu code has been reformed and bills have been passed and the other communities hasn't gives as you, as you can see a great kind of political weapon to the hindu right to say that the indian state actually hasn't been secular in the sense that the state has adopted it which is equal principled and equal distance from all communities as I said, religious is never stated. They say conscience, but it is, as you know, from its inception, it's been marked as they have been marked as religious communities. So that's the unfortunate uh, effect of of the passing of the Hindu Code Bill. Very quickly, Shabarno, what happens? Shabarno, uh, this uh, she was over seventy. She had been married for fifty years. Huh? When her husband, a lawyer, very smart, divorces her. Now, the point is the things that we don't know. Shabano's eldest son, who is obviously also a lawyer and an adult, obviously by then, uh, in his 50s probably, asks the mother to resort to the Supreme Court and the Uniform Court, because she was married and divorced within the Muslim personal law, to get what? Maintenance, to claim maintenance. 
because Muslim, um, if we follow the Muslim, uh, you know, laws or the injunctions of the Quran, uh, if we think of those days also, marriage is a contract. Marriage is not like sacrosanct also, you know, in Christian uh, ideas also, you know, it's still death do us part. In Hindu also, it's like, it's, it's f for the entire life, we think of it that way. And hence, there is provision for, for maintenance, alimony. In Muslim law, since it's a contract between two individuals, the her husband, what he does is to pay a little bit at, when the marriage is contracted and pays up the later, which is kept as it that, you know, for later in case the marriage dissolves. So what this husband does when she resorts to the Supreme Court, what the husband does, of course, as I said, he's a, he's a lawyer himself. He quickly pays up the idat. And he says, you know, I've done my duty. The marriage is dissolved. I've paid what I was meant to pay. And that's, you know, sanctioned by the Quran. And I've done exactly the right thing. Now, the problem is this was a time in 1980s. Rajiv Gandhi is also, as you know, a very immature politician who was brought into being after the sudden assassination of his mother. And he's not trained in politics, doesn't know the pulse of the nation. The Hindu right is actually coming into the political mainstream. Even more important is that when the Supreme Court gives the verdict for the first time, these are justices of the Supreme Court and principally the one who frames it, Justice Chandra Chur, the father of a current one, who's given another verdict on Ayodhya, I cannot go into the details. He is saying that the Sharia is not good for women and it needs to be reformed. So what happens is that, you know, the, the appeal of Shah Bano as a wo woman who needed help because she had other, no other means of livelihood is completely bypassed. It becomes a fight over, you know, how Hindu laws are progressive and, you know, Hindus are better and the Muslims are not. You know, how Shabano is totally forgotten in this. And the, the, the worst thing is that the, the alimony that the Supreme Court is actually ruling is hundred something rupees a month which even in 1980s in India would have made Shabano survive for a few days. So all this is forgotten. The debate now becomes, and, and as you can understand, any authoritarian centralized state would want to push for uniform court. No? So this is like a chance to say that Muslim personal laws are terrible for women without taking into consideration the women and um, that we should push for uniform court. Feminist scholars and lawyers face a huge dilemma, huge dilemma. And the struggle actually comes out mature because they realize that in, in you know, pushing for the uniform code, you are overriding the, the rights of communities and that also include women. But if you insist that they retain their personal laws unchanged, you are also overriding the, the rights of women in certain sense and wishes of women. And so the question that Dina Vina Das had posed at this sense is that who, what is the community? Who defines the culture? Do women have the option of saying that I'm not a, for a part of this community? I want to form a community, let's say, of women, of sisterhood. Do they have this option? They don't in any, any law, you know, whether of the state, whether of the international community. So these were the questions she was putting. What kind of collective? What is the collective? What is culture? The dominant role of you know defining culture. Who does it? All that. But the point is, at this stage, Shabano retracts. As I said, the alimony was very little. She retracts. She says that she does not, given the charged situation no, of, of Hindus, Muslim, Hindu right coming into providence, she said she does not want to go against her community. So overnight, she becomes a traitor. As you know, some groups, of course, have the time to reflect, consider they're mature, others not. So all even the women's groups who are fighting for her, you know, she's a traitor. They don't know what to do. OK, so this is the Shabano case. What happens actually, Rajiv Gandhi's and, and from pressure from certain, certain groups, prominent groups of Muslim, you know, personal law board and others, there's a bill that's brought and passed actually in the parliament that Muslim women, divorced Muslim women, will be uh, will not come will be uh, secluded from the pur pur purview of the uniform code 
so again you can see you know that that the government is totally partial it's giving all this to you know giving it's being partial to the minority communities it's uh you know letting them do whatever they want so rajiv gandhi does two things which is not part of the talk he does you know this he backswings on the other way completely i mean the two uh, ends of the um, pendulum is one he allows the lock to be broken over the very over the disputed ramjan mabhumi ayodhya site which was actually a mosque he allows the lock to be broken you know falling prey to you know hindu nationalist demands and then he allows this this bill to be passed you know the the muslim women protection of rights of divorce act what lawyers who have who actually have worked with muslim women divorced muslim women the other important thing is you know uh, women muslim women had resorted to the uniform code before and they continue to do so it has not generated debate nor sensationalism nothing no but you know media has forgotten we don't know about it but this extremely you know uh, debated and uh, maligned act the muslim women protection of rights of on divorce act lawyers who act with muslim women have said that sometimes have given better opportunities to muslim women depending on their own resources and the arguments of their lawyers by drawing upon quranic or islamic notions of justice and fairness and sometimes they've gotten um, they've got a much better deal than what the you know the uniform code would give them by way of um, uh, aliment so these are again as i said there are no solutions there are no solutions and the hindu code of course has also been challenged by by mm. feminist scholars and legal scholars because they're questioning the very notion of hindu and i gave you that is why i gave you the you know the 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 entire genesis saying what is hindu who defines it and again by saying hindu law that there is something like a hindu law are aren't we actually perpetrating this idea that you know india is very different from the west where you know law and religion have nothing to do with each other not just india south south asia you know the orient remains like the orient that's very different triple talaq again is very interesting quranic injunctions clearly say that you cannot you cannot say the three talaqs at one go okay but that is the widespread knowledge common knowledge that you turn to as makkah and you say talaq 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 and you divorce your wife you know there were jokes i grew up hearing those jokes of men know that i can do so and i take another wife in any case i can take four wives etc quran if you follow the quran the idea is that you cannot do so there has to be a lunar month that has to elapse before the three talaq which means three months and during this time family friends everyone you know they are trying to bring about a uh, negotiation and finally if that's not possible yes. but what has happened is certain you know including the muslim personal law board you know dominated by men they accept it although it's totally against that's that's a contradiction totally against quranic injunctions they accept it. and what happened is the hindu right uh, once again pounced upon the triple talaq first to divide votes in a very very important uh, province of north india it's important because it has a huge number of seats in the main parliament so you know who you vote for you know from up uttar pradesh um, has actually defines you know to a large extent which party would win the you know major not even not the majority but the largest number of seats in the parliament in the election but anyway so they pounced upon it once again to pose as defenders of women and obviously women were divided because of obviously if you do triple tag luck at one setting and you you are left kind of i mean one your your uh, uh, so the struggle uh, and this is along with lawyers lawyers legal scholars women activists you know within the the you know muslim their groups of muslim women who want to reform their own, own personal laws and also make laws in general more gender sensitive and that that is a struggle which is not just for muslim women no it's not as if they say we want to do away with personal laws completely but we want to reform it you know as i said following quranic injunctions are in, you know our interpretations of them 
and drawing upon uh, other, you know, transnational and other um, law codes uh, that they think afford better substantive equality to women. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Should I stop sharing now? You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So your comments, questions, doubts, yeah. So please, everyone, feel free to either raise your hand in the app or simply turn on your microphone, your camera, and start speaking. Or if you can't speak, you can type your questions in the chat and we'll read them out loud. If someone doesn't feel too comfortable with their level of English, feel free to ask the question in Serbian and I'll translate. While the people are thinking, I'd like to ask a question since you've just dispelled some of the common myths that are, I think, widespread about Indian society and Hindu law. Uh, could you also tell us uh, how widespread is the practice of child brides today? Because that is something that is popularly perceived as a problem that India faces even today, but we don't really know, at least the majority of us don't, the real extent of this practice and how problematic it is. Actually, I don't think it's legally permitted. So, so you know, if there are practices, I won't say that it has stopped completely, but, but they are kind of done surreptitiously and it's not very widespread. You know, I, I haven't come across in all my years of growing up, I, I don't know of a single instance. But as I said, it's it's not legally allowed, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It probably happens, but yeah, always clandestinely. And yeah. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Professor Stimich, maybe? I have something to observe. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the only child uh, that uh, uh, gain uh, 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 I, I can't <laughs> remember uh, a price of, of uh, Nobel is uh, that the girl uh, 16 old girl of uh, peace uh, two years ago i think so it exists there obviously mm -hmm. you remember i can't remember the name of that girl but she was very mm -hmm. famous mm -hmm. she addressed to to uh, uh, government i think mm -hmm. all governments of the world to pay attention to to the rights of girls. You, mm -hmm. I think that you can remember of her because she was very famous. Yeah, I can yeah, I can remember her case, but I don't remember her name right now. Yes, but yes, yes. And as I said, obviously it exists. But what, so, uh, so but she what is, is a major problem. Mm -hmm. She's the only girl that they gained that uh, pri Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is uh, very existing. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, it depends. If you're of, speaking of, 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 a, of a huge population of 1.3 billion, it's also, you know, what catches media attention and what spreads, you know. But yes, I'm not denying that it doesn't exist. But uh, for me, what is a much greater problem is actually child prostitution which is not talked about as much and there's a huge market of you know young girls being prostituted which which you know these are transnational networks and uh, that's that's that is pretty yeah 
this modern society no yeah no. but it is very disturbing yes. and it's not yeah. really talked about as much as it should be yeah it is, exists in europe also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah these are transnational networks as i said yeah yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't remember the name of that girl, but she she was very famous and she was very clever and cute. I have to look it up too because I can't remember her name. Yeah, sorry. But she's the only child that gained that uh, Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Professor Vladimir Simic from Ljubljana and then from our Una Divac. So, Professor Simic, we lost your video. I hope you can still hear us. Professor Letruje, Telinas. Since there seems to be a connection problem, let us skip to Una's question. And then when the professor reconnects, hopefully he'll ask his question. Uh, hello, thank you for a wonderful uh, and interesting uh, lecture tonight. Um, I do have some questions about the practice of sati because I have heard about it, but I don't know any particular details or why it existed as a tradition. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me um, why was the position of widows so bad that some women decided to incinerate themselves in order to avoid it? And that's my first question. Then I can ask afterwards the second if if that's all right. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I think the professor is back, so maybe we can take his question okay. as well. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Professor Simon, to go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, when you. that an Indian can choose. It means that he can choose also between courts, or is it one court that applies either, both court, uh, both laws, personal law and unified law? How does that work on the level of the courts? Okay, this is easier to answer. I'll come to Sati later then. No, please, please, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, pardon me. See, personal laws, as I, I mentioned, form a very small part of the entire code of, you know, civil and criminal procedure from the beginning it's not as if anyone talked about the entire body of civil rights or uh, civil law or the entire body of criminal law it's just the matters that i i mentioned no marriage inheritance succession etc so for the others everyone is governed by by the uniform uh, code so and for personal laws as i said it's the citizens who decide whether they want to take recourse to their personal laws in the very few matters that fall within the purview of our, uh, personal laws, although they are very important matters, as I said, marriage, succession, property, property rights, dissent, all, all that stuff, or they want to go to the uniform code. So, Thank you. Yeah. And now to come back to Sati. See, these, the, it's very difficult to explain how and when the practice started because it's also related to these are stories, you know, in Rajasthan that um, that is the, you know, like consciously the land of Rajas and uh, when they got news and prince of, uh, and princes that when they got news, the women got news that uh, their, um, their, the, that their men had been defeated in war. But as I said, we don't really know. They would jump into the, the fire. They would lit a huge fire and jump into it in order not to be violated by, by whoever, you know, the invaders and uh, destroy their the purity. But see, purity of the lineage is of great importance, particularly in Brahmanical thought. And as I said, it's patrilineal descent. Now, how that got connected to the practice of sati 
at some stage it is difficult to say and as i said we have had we have um, instances of sati in rajasthan and the other part was in the south of india which was also a very consciously uh, hindu kingdom but a few instances hmm? there's also this idea as i said that marriage is sacrosanct but not just that that husband and wife together form one body and this i know from my mother is very strange she said it's the wife's duty apparently to protect her husband so i don't know whether the women who committed sati actually thought that way but when my father passed away in great grief of course she said i failed my duty to to protect my husband so it can be interpreted both ways that you have internalized this very patriarchal discourse or that you give yourself this enormous power to protect your husband as i said it, you know these are interpretations we don't know how to do it again i do not know whether the women who committed sati did it actually being you know totally convinced or they were forced there are all kinds of arguments that you know the the widow had actually the right to the husband's property so the you know other men of the family of the husband's family didn't want that and there were clear injunctions as i said no you know like a, a child bride of um, 15 16 years who had uh, who had a very very young baby couldn't do it you had to have a grown up son who could take care of the family because imagine otherwise you know both the parents dying who will take care of the family so there were several injunctions and again we don't know how many cases actually happened what we do know is that when the when the debate the huge debate was going uh, on in calcutta the instances of sati increased in and around calcutta because now you know lower caste who never practice sati there's both about you know like defending tradition and two lower caste who didn't practice sati are now sometimes forcing but had enough wealth in order to get the social standing the social status some of them are actually forcing their women to to commit sati so it's extremely difficult because as i said i heard it from my mother but I, i'm not sure i cannot tell you it's how many women actually believed that you know they that they failed in their right or duty to protect their husbands and that you know the two bodies turned into one so if one half dies the other half is dead anyway but i mean i cannot you know prove it at all that you know women actually believed in it the ones who who committed sati what i do know can you hear me yes yes we can yes, yes, okay we can. because all your all your pictures went off so i thought my connection has gone off again but anyway what i do know is that when the debate was going on again these are you know stories that you hear anecdotes that you hear. there was a woman who came and this is vidya sagar the one who was fighting for widow remarriage not not against sati came and passed her finger through the flame of a candle till the time it got burnt to show that she could actually actually do it because think of it you know most of what we know is the many of the women even if they had been sometimes they said they were drugged sometimes they said they were coerced they were totally indoctrinated brainwashed we do not know but what we do know that in the few instances that it was being committed when the flames reach your body i mean think of the unbearable pain so some of them tried to jump out this woman on the other hand waited till her finger got burnt to show her resolve that she could actually take so these are you know as i said extremely difficult cases but what is true is that as i said it was an it was a heroic act if you committed a sati you almost joined like a the league, uh, the league of the saints women said saints very complicated so yeah what's the other question you had another question you said i was just interesting when a uh, uh, practice of sati became a uh, band mm -hmm. uh, who was who was punished if someone tried to commit i mean if a woman tried to commit sati and died in a process of course she she couldn't be punished but 
who was punished in that case? The community who allowed it or? It was a family. It was a family. It was a family, particularly the men. But then, you know, it continued. But as I said, uh, since there were very few cases, I doubt if they were even reported for the family to be punished. No, after after it was banned. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I would like some feedback from you on this this problem, the idea of you know individual rights and and collective rights. The you know the individual as the subject of rights and and the collective as the subject of rights. Maybe some feedback from your part. Well, it it is definitely a very complicated issue, and mm -hmm. you're right that there is, like you said, that there is a falsely asserted dichotomy of Western law being completely separate from religion, which it might formally be now in most states, but it still has been heavily influenced by religion during its development. And on the other hand, Eastern law is being primarily religious. Uh, similarly, I think uh, there is a false dichotomy between personal and collective interests nowadays in the broadly speaking Western community. Uh, I, I can't speak for the Eastern. I'm not saying it's uh, very different there. I simply don't know. But it seems as if they're saying that the individual has all rights and that has to have a priority before all. And then maybe in some second tier, uh, we could have some collective rights, but that systems who put the collective before the individual are strange and exotic and implicitly less worthy. And yet again, if we look at many uh, even earlier stages of development of Western law, uh, we see the community as playing a very, very important role here, and the whole uh, personal development is the thing of the last few centuries. So I think it's really a very open question, and some sort of balance should be maintained. Now, how possible that is in a concrete country with its actual problems, I'm sure it's very difficult. But I can't see a healthy society without both the individuals and the community's rights being present. I don't know what you think about that. Mm -hmm. See, my point was precisely this, to bring the experience of India, you know, because it has really is a very illustrative example. And yes, as you, you know, I, I thank you deeply for your invitation. There are certain stereotypes, you know, Still, unfortunately, you know, despite so much communication, so much uh, of thinking of, let's say, the East or at least India or South Asian countries differently. But I think in, in general, East, the Islamic world, let's say, you know, the point is, how is law first formulated, interpreted, implemented? And there are tensions. These are all of these are extremely fraught processes. So my idea was that if the experience of India, you know, also inspires you to think about, you know, how it's, you know, how its law is, you know, implemented, and what role do lawyers, not just judges, because lawyers are the ones arguing the case, also you no know, pleaders and lawyers, and and the interpretation of judges. And what do the actual citizens do with it to when they think they take recourse to law? No? So my idea was just, as I said, to open a dialogue by making actual experience and histories uh, travel. No? So, and who is the individual? Because, because as you know, feminist scholars have also questioned the notion of an abstract citizenship. So it's it's a totally abstract universal category which does not which has very little bearing on the context of people in general whether it's you know a poor, poorer person of a different social class and women in particular also 
So they are speaking of, you know, layered or differentiated citizenship. They say that, you know, we have to start there before we claim rights as women citizens. What kind of citizens are we? And this is something that, uh, that you know, in India, particularly in your case, I guess it's, it's, you know, it's a smaller society or maybe the diversity is not as much also. But uh, there have been questions of, you know, citizenship and what kind of rights do we have as citizens and how do we come to exercise those rights? So, you know, so. If I may add, just as an example from these parts, it might be interesting to you. I mean, at first, generally, uh, part precisely those issues of uh, family law, marriage, inheritance, those that are deeply personal are the most problematic ones when it comes to change because naturally tradition plays the strongest roles there, whether you need to sign a paper or do something else to uh, buy a car or a house is not as important to someone as to uh, as compared to what you do to get married and who inherits the property and so on. And so the situation here in Serbia, for example, very briefly, um, when the Serbian Civil Code was passed in 1844, the man who wrote the code, Jovan Hadžić, tried to make a balance between the Serbian customs, which were also fairly patriarchal at the time, and some more modern tendencies, mostly based on Austrian and French law. Mm -hmm. And he was criticized by both sides. So some said uh, that he copied too much from the foreign law and so on, that he uh, destroyed uh, our good local customs, while some said, on the other hand, uh, that he uh, adopted those uh, retrograde patriarchal customs that limited women's rights and so on. And in the neighboring country of Montenegro, half a century later in 1888, but Montenegro developed slower in that period, uh, Walter Zalbogisic, who wrote the Montenegrin Code, opted to leave family and inheritance law out of the code entirely. He said it wasn't ready to be codified. There, there were too many different family customs. And so he generally ran away from that complicated subject. Not that he wasn't versed in it. He wrote many uh, scholarly works about it, but he simply didn't want to try and impose one solution on everyone. And then when Yugoslavia united after World War I, there were different territories, all South Slavic populations, but three faiths now, uh, Orthodox Christians, Catholic Christians, and Muslims. And uh, generally, the yeah. only, Samo Malo, the only branch of law that uh, wasn't cod codified in Yugoslavia was civil law precisely because they couldn't find a uniform solution to all these problems. So just as a parallel, it might be a different uh, territory, but the similar types of problems exist probably everywhere. Thank you so much. This is the feedback I was looking for. I mean, the case of Montenegro is very interesting. You see, it's almost like Warren Hastings. Let's leave the native, you know, and their customs unmolested. You know, like let them follow their customs unmolested. And they never thought of civil and criminal law, the entire body of civil and criminal law, just these personal family laws. So it is, you know, the examples you give, maybe we can start a conversation later. Although I'm no legal scholar, no expert at all, but I am interested in, you know, in, in what is going on in India now, especially with the, you know, Hindu right and all problems. For instance, you know, the women's struggle, as I said, it's, it's, it, it, is at, it has several trends, but it is also, quote unquote, because I don't believe in these uh, terms, advanced in the sense, you know, rape within marriage has been a huge matter of discourse, you know, public debates also, that can you actually admit rape within marriage? not which is like a little bit 
if you think of the age of consent debate, it was that. It was forceful consummation of marriage of a very young bride. In this case, women are saying it's not just young brides, it's it's about, you know, the any wife who is not giving consent. Right? And uh, so, yeah, these are the things, you know, leaves us, by, you know, yeah, as I said, my, my idea was to take this uh, opportunity to start a dialogue precisely to, you know, and instead of thinking of India as something very, very different, you know, we face more or less the same kind of problems, despite very different histories, let's say. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we don't have any more questions, let us thank Professor Banerjee Dube once again for being our guest. It would be very nice if we had the opportunity to host you at some point in the future live in Belgrade. But even if that doesn't happen, we'll be happy to continue our online collaboration and further dialogue. Yeah. Thank you once again and thank you. Maybe see you some other time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And as I said, although I see the, the, the all possibilities of you know these uh, WebEx meetings, I am totally in favor. But let me also say I'd be delighted to come to Belgrade at some stage. <laughs> it's a part of the world that I would like to find out more about. Wonderful. Then we'll do our best to make it happen. Uh, internet conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah. And Thank you will. Once again, thank you everyone for your attention. Goodbye and see you in the future. Thank you. Goodbye, Goodbye. thank you. Goodbye.